I'm going to talk about this static site generator called Plenty, which is a project that I've been working on. Um, started on the side a little bit. I've been working on it more full time recently. And basically the idea behind this project is I really love Svelte. I think Svelte is uh, the, the framework for the future. Um, not only is it fast and it kind of kills the virtual DOM and a lot of those things, but uh, I really love it mostly because it's a developer friendly framework and especially a framework that uh, lowers the barriers for a lot of new people getting into tech. So I'm sure a lot of people on this call are familiar with Svelte, but if you're not, it's uh, it feels like you're writing regular HTML and CSS. And then even though it's really JavaScript uh, intensive and it has a lot of interactivity to it, it feels like you're almost sprinkling that interactivity in as you need it and where you want it to be. Um, and it does a lot of things that you're going to want out of the box, like scoping CSS styles to components and things like that. And I'm also a big fan of component-driven architecture. So I've been really excited about Svelte in general, and I think uh, it's a, a great step in the right direction to lowering the barrier for people getting into tech. Now, I'm also a big fan of static site generators, and I, you know I've done a lot of work with Jekyll and Hugo, and I love the, the traditional style static site generator where there's not a ton of dependencies and it's really easy to get up and running with like a very basic file structure and um, a very clear and transparent path between your content structure and, and your um, HTML site layouts. So I wanted to bring Svelte over into a Jamstack first type framework where basically all Plenty is doing is doing static site generating. So it's, it's building everything, like all your assets on uh, ahead of time and then deploying everything as static assets to your final hosting. So that might be a CDN, it might be like Netlify or even GitHub pages or GitLab pages. So that's basically the the main direction that I'm trying to take with Plenty. Uh, it's kind of a unique approach here. So let me just take a look at the repository. So if anyone's interested in looking at the code here, it's it's available publicly on GitHub. It's uh, forward slash Plentico forward slash Plenty. And it's completely open source. So you can download it, you can uh, modify it, fork it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and uh, this is where you go to do that. And basically what we're doing here is it has uh, a Go backend. And that's kind of weird because if you're familiar with Svelte, you know it's a JavaScript framework and oftentimes you would use Node on the backend to actually compile some of the components um, since it is basically a compiler. And we actually don't require Node.js at all in the project. So you can see here as of uh, version 0 0.2, we stopped requiring this. Although we have at the moment still an optional node build if you prefer to do that and you want to manipulate things, but you don't need it at all. So you can actually just download the project and you don't need Node.js on it. Even though it's a Go project, you don't need Go on your computer. You don't need NPM. You really don't need anything besides the binary that you download yourself. So it makes it really easy to download. If you're on a Mac and you use Homebrew, you can use the Homebrew package manager to download the project. If you're on a Linux computer, you can use Snap. Now, Windows support, ever since I, I cut over to the newer version of Plenty and we got rid of the node uh, builds, uh, the Windows support is a little bit shaky, but you can use something called WSL. Uh, I believe it stands for Windows Subsystem for Linux. And newer versions of Windows actually ship with a Linux kernel, so you can actually basically set up a Linux-like environment in your Windows computer, uh, and you can use Plenty that way. So you can just download the binary and put it in your path that way, and then just generate the site structure just like you would any other Linux system. So if you're interested in Winic, uh, Windows support, that's what you do for now. But hopefully we'll get some native Windows support in the near future. There's a little bit of a issue around how we're actually doing the compiling. So the way that Plenty actually builds Svelte components on the back end is we use V8 directly. So we use a project that uh, basically interprets JavaScript inside Go, and then we compile those components, and then we use Go to build the, the structure and actually uh, print out all the files that are needed for your site. So it's all kind of happening in this weird back end system uh, that's, that's hidden from the user for the most part. Um, but it makes it a little more difficult to provide support for all uh, uh, platforms because the V8 Go uh, system that is, is compiling the JavaScript actually uses C Go, which is a, a C-based uh, extension of the Go language. And when you compile that way, it basically makes it more difficult to compile for every operating system. So that's why we're at that weird juncture where Windows is not completely supported. But that's the idea for the project. And uh, hopefully when people take a look at it, it's a fast and consistent experience. Uh, and it's really simple and it takes a lot of the overhead 
uh, out of thinking about setting up like a simple website. So you don't have to really worry about routing, uh, HTML fallbacks, and things like that. We actually try to take care of as much of that out of the box as we can. And although we're a little bit opinionated, we, we try to just make it as simple as possible and give you chances to eject from the system and configure things how you'd like if you want to do that. Now, I figured the easiest way to actually go about looking at some of the stuff is to just look at some basic projects ourselves and feel free to ask questions as I hop into some of this stuff, but I'll just go through some of the features and maybe we can discuss where we're going in the future with some of this. How easy do you think it would be for someone who has never used Go to jump in? I'm hoping that it's really easy. So I, I would think that the only time you would need any Go knowledge is if you want to contribute to like the project itself, right? So this is like the engine that runs your sites, but the when you download it and you start using it, hopefully you don't really need to know Go at all. I'm trying to think if there's any places where Go knowledge would really be beneficial. And I don't think there's a ton there. Maybe for like error. So some some of our probably weaker points right now are the, some of the error handling and things like that. So if you're familiar with like Go error handling, uh, when something does go wrong, that might be helpful for you there. But for the most part, I'm hoping that you don't really need any Go knowledge to use the project. It'd be a nice way to kind of give some people a foot in also. Like I know a lot of JavaScript devs, they like kind of want to get some other languages under their belt. So it'd be good to kind of expand out in that way also. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I'm hoping that like if people like this approach and they, they generally like using it, that they'd be more excited to, to dive into the code base and take a look at this. And, um, you know, I'm no expert in Go by any means. I kind of have been learning as I built this project out. So uh, it's really a great learning project. And, and Go is a super readable language. Um, it has a really small kind of footprint in terms of like how big the scope of the language is. So the syntax is pretty clear. It's sometimes a little bit verbose because there's not a lot of syntactical things you can do as shortcuts, but there's really only one way to, to accomplish certain things. So it's very readable and consistent. So if people are interested in learning Go, I think this might be a good code base to take a look at. Um, and I'd be more than happy to, to walk through or explain things to people if they are interested. So definitely feel free to reach out to me or open up issues or um, I've even actually gone through the code base here and started tagging some like good first issues here for people that shouldn't take a lot of knowledge to get up and running um, because it goes a little bit different than, than Node, for instance, because you're compiling things instead of interpreting them. So it's just a little bit of a different workflow, but once you get used to it, it's not super hard to, to understand. So um, I'm hoping, yeah, I think it's a good opportunity for people to get their foot in the door with Go a little bit more. That's cool, yeah. I think it's awesome that you have good first issues also. Like all projects should do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I mean, I have a couple of sprinkled throughout here. We've had some people actually pick these up and run with them. So I'm hoping that um, it, it actually is helpful for people to have that flag. And then I'll, I'll keep making more of those. Sometimes I actually just make issues specifically for uh, people to take a look at. Like a couple of these I could probably fix in, in five or 10 minutes, but I, I think it'd be better for someone to get their, their feet wet with it a little bit by just taking a look for the first time, so. Um, so, okay, so I'm over here on my desktop and I already have plenty installed, so I'm not going to go through that. It's, it's pretty much um, just using your package manager. It shouldn't be more complex than that. But once you have plenty installed, you can start doing plenty commands with the um, plenty uh, command here. And this is, uh, as long as this is in your path, you should be able to run these commands. And the first command I want to run here is I want to create a new site here. And we'll just call this Svelte Society Bay Area. And if I run that command, it basically creates a scaffolding for a new site. And if you look inside that scaffolding, you'll see that there's some general files in here. But I think it might be easier to actually just open this up in a text editor so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to open this in Codium, which is just basically the free binary of VS Code. And let me just try to increase the size here so people can see it. Hopefully I can still navigate what's going on here. I want to just quickly go over like what is in this scaffolding out of the box. So when you create a new site that way that I just did, basically what it's doing is it's creating the default starter. And this is what I intended this to do is serve as a starting point for people who are looking at the project for the first time. So there's a little bit of scaffolding in here that is uh, supposed to be used as an exploratory project for people to see how the general site works. Um, so it starts with a folder called assets, which basically holds things like uh, images and videos and any of your static assets. There's a content folder. This is your data source. And everything in the first layer of your content folder is a content type. So it groups 
content by similar type features. So if you have a data structure that is consistent across a bunch of nodes, you'd wanna group them as a content type. So for instance, blog pages, all blog pages in my site look kind of similar, so I group them together. There's regular pages, and then there's an index page, which is just our home page. And since our home page is designed a little differently than some of our internal pages, I broke it out into a single file content type like this. Then there's our layout folder, and this is basically the Svelte templates that provide the structure for the site. And I broke this into a couple of logical folders. So I have a global folder, which basically has an HTML wrapper. And you can see that it looks just like regular HTML here. Let me see if I can make this like this. Okay, so it looks like regular HTML. And then we have a head, which has some metadata, footer, and a navigation. Um, and I have another folder here, components. These are different components that I reuse throughout the starter. And there's a scripts folder here, and these are basically exported scripts. So they're Svelte files, but they're really just little helper functions that are just little snippets of JavaScript that I pull in. And then an important folder here is this content folder, because this content folder here corresponds to our content data source, but it's the structure for those pages. So for each one of these content types, we're going to have a corresponding template that basically gives the structure for that, that overarching node page. And now we can pull other components into those uh, those pages, but it gives the general structure for those pages. And the way that works essentially is we have this dynamic Svelte component here that's inside of our HTML wrapper. And then we get the route that we're on currently. And that basically gives us, uh, it, it sends us over to one of these individual templates. So for instance, we have a page template, we have our blog template, which corresponds to all these blog pages here. We have a homepage template, and then we have some 404 handling here as well. So uh, you basically, as long as you match up a content source with one of these content uh, templates here, you'll have a way to, to visit end nodes. And you can create many of these nodes here, and they will be served up by a single template over here if you want to do that. So for instance, this blog template serves up many end nodes. But let's just take a look at what the, the default starter looks like out of the box. I'm going to open up my terminal here. and. I'm inside the project here, and I'm just going to do a command plenty serve. And that's basically going to start up a little web server here that we can use to take a look at our project there. So I'm going to copy this URL. And let me go to Firefox and just open this up. Okay, so this is the default starter out of the box. You'll notice here that we have some internal pages here. So we have an about page, a contact page. They basically just give some information about the project. And at the bottom of each one of the pages, I, I created this little widget that tells what template is being used to serve this. So you can actually come in here, for instance, and you could copy this and you could go back to your code base and you could do like a search for files and you can pull up that specific template to see what's going on in there. So let's see, let me close that. Um, so this is the, the pages template and that's serving up this page here. This one over here is using an index template. If you were to go to any of these blog pages, you see that they're coming from a blog template. Now, there's a couple of interesting things going on here. So one is we're aggregating a bunch of blog pages on our home page right here. So these are just little uh, things I wanted to share with folks. Um, I'm gonna change some of this stuff around because I've gotten some feedback that like this example here is kind of confusing. I'll go over it in a second, um, but this could be a little more straightforward for, for new folks taking a look at this for the first time. But the way that you pull in content from other pages on a page like this is we have a special variable inside our project here. So if I went to the index page, which is the home page template, you'll see here, and let me make this bigger. You see here that we're using this all uh, content prop here, and we're pulling that in. We're pulling it in from our router. You don't have to really know where it's coming from because it just happens behind the scenes. Um, but when you come down here, you can see that we're actually passing all content here we're filtering it first by a blog type. And this is something that we actually get out of the box. So each one of our pieces of content is gonna have a type and it's gonna have some other information like a path um, and it's gonna have all your fields. And we're basically filtering in there. We're passing it to our, our component here called grid. And then in grid, we're basically just doing a for each loop um, that's going through each one of these items and it's printing them out on the page. So you can use that special variable, that special uh, all content variable to pull in content from other types and aggregate them onto different pages if you want. Um, another thing I wanna mention here is over here in our content sources. So if we were to look at any of these blog pages, for instance, the field structure here is completely up to you. So it's completely flexible. There are no defined fields and there are no 
required fields or even um, fields that are special in our namespace. So you could call this title, you could call it name, you could call it titles. You can name these whatever you want and your field structure is completely up to you. And the way that we handle that is when we actually look into our templates there, um, we put them in a special object called the, the fields object. But let's take a look at that here. Um, if I go back to the grid, you can see that, for instance, we get the title out of our, our item fields and we print it like that. Now, I know that's kind of, that's, that's a lot. Are people still with me on how that's all kind of being rigged up together there? I'll take that as a yes, unless someone interjects. Um, okay, so we have our content source that feeds into our templates like that. Now, by default, each one of these pieces of content here, um, so all your blogs, all your pages, and your homepage, they're all gonna be an individual node on the website. So you notice here that we have, you know, um, all these individual nodes, so we have our pages, we have our blog posts, we have our index page. And by default, basically all these nodes are going to be getting the path that they they are assigned in their, um, their place in the file structure. So if you do nothing else and you leave everything else the same, each one of these pages, for instance, in our blog site is going to get the path blog and then the file name minus the .json part. Um, and if like, if there's underscores, those will get converted to like hyphens and things like that. Um, and so that's why each one of these blogs here, if you look at it, it gets a path called blog and then the name of the file. And you see that's consistent across the board here. But if you look at one of these pages, you'll notice that the about page is not in a folder called pages about, it's just at, a, a, at the top level, it's at forward slash about. And the way you take care of that is you can actually come down here and there's a site-wide configuration file here called plenty.json. And if you look in there, you can override your routes. So we have this types declaration. So it corresponds to our different content types here. So we can override routes based on content type. So we have three possibilities of overrides here. We could override our index, our pages, or our blog. And right now we're targeting our pages. And then we're using a replacement pattern here to just say, give us a forward slash and give us the file name. And that's, that's one of our uh, available replacement patterns. There are other replacement patterns. So we could come in here and for instance, let's say we want to override some of our blog pages. We could target the blog posts. And then we could say something like, um, right now it's at forward slash blog, but maybe we want this at forward slash blog. So let me, before I do that, let me show you. So we're over here, forward slash blog components. Let's change this to forward slash blogs. And then maybe we want a specific value out of our actual content source. So if we look at one of our individual pages here, so let's just look at this plenty form page here. And let me just make it so you can see it. Um, we have these defined keys in each one of our blog posts. So we know we have a title, a body, an author, and a date, even though we set these up specifically ourselves, we could target one of these and get the values out. So maybe we want the title from our, our data source in our route. We can come back over here to our override. We could say, well, give me a field and give me the title field. And I want that used in one of my routes. And I could save this. And as long as my site rebuilds, okay, I could come back over here, reload my page. And if I go to one of these now, oh, it looks like I might have broke something here. What did I do? Okay. Um, so, so now you can see that the, um, the route is different here. So we have blogs, dynamic components example now. So this is the, the title from the actual blog post that's been slugified for, for that. So you can use any field value you want. Um, I just use the title in this example because that's easiest, but you can override your routes to be whatever you want them to be. Um, and we have several different replacement patterns for actually going and doing some of that. Okay. Great, and then, um, okay, so another thing you might wanna do is you might wanna create new content types here. So let me show an example of doing that. So I'm just opening up a new terminal window here and maybe it'd be easier to show some of my files. So we have these content types here, right? And we have these templates here. Now maybe we want a new content type like news. So we could do a command plenty new type and we could say news if we do that, it creates some scaffolding for us. So it'll create a new folder here in our content source called news. It'll create a new template for us over here called news.svelte, which corresponds to that content type. 
and it actually creates a blueprint.json file. Don't worry too much about that right now. This is just basically showing your default structure in case you want to create a lot of the pages with the same structure. And this is going to tie into a CMS that we're working on as well. But for now, basically you can create the structure. You can use that command that I just used to save you some time to build that scaffolding. You could actually just do that manually as well. You could just create this folder in this file here. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you to do that. It's just a way to save some time. But if you come in here and you were to add a new file, so we could say news item onejson and as long as we have some valid JSON in here, you need to have at least you know some uh, brackets for it to work or else it'll break your build. But as long as you have a bracket, you could make any key name you want. So I'm gonna say um, custom name and just say hi. And I'll save that. And then if I were to come over here and add to our news.svelte template, we could basically pull in that key value, so script, and then just pull it in like this, export, let, what did I call it, custom name? I think that's what I called it. Yep, and then you can start using it in your markup. So you can start using your template. So we can make an H1, for instance, and I could say, give me the custom name. Like that, and then just save that. Um, and come back over here and reload the site. And we should have a new, so this is just displaying all content at the bottom here. I mean, this is just something I rigged up to make it easier for people to find new pages. But you can click on your new item and you can see now that this is already being put in our template. The, the end route's already created with the default. We could override this if we wanted, just like we did before, but that item's created there and you can start creating news items if you wanted that way. Cool. Another thing I figured might be nice to show is just a couple of these examples that we have out of the box. So for instance, you know, you can do writable stores just like you would do in normal Svelte, that should work. Um, you can come over here and I think this is kind of interesting even though I've gotten the feedback that I might have to change this example to make it a little more clear what's actually happening here. But there's this concept of content driven components. So typically if I want to pull in a component, so for instance, let's take a look at our news page. Um, we have a bunch of different Svelte templates we could pull in, right? So we have these, um, maybe we want to pull in the, the incrementer from our um, stores example that we just took a look at. The way you'd normally do that is you'd have to come in here and say, import, you know, my incrementer from the path. So it's components incrementer dots felt. And then I could come down here once that's imported and I could actually, you know, add my incrementer down here. I could save that and I could come back here to my site and let me just go to my homepage, reload that and come here and you can see that it pulled in that component there, right? So you can pull in components like you would in a normal salt project, but you might want to actually not go through this process of importing every one of these explicitly in your templates. Like you might want to have some kind of builder where your content source is defining which components you want and then your templates not explicitly calling out each one of these imports. It's just saying, hey, go get me that template based on what I defined in my content source. Now, that's a little bit difficult because basically you'd have to do dynamic imports uh, in your project. And uh, if you're familiar with dynamic imports, they all happen asynchronously and you would actually have to have some trouble to get the HTML fallbacks to work correctly because they're all server-side rendered. So we have this concept that we've added to the project that allows you to pull these in dynamically. So um, if we take a look at our blog post here, so we have this example in our blog post, this components example. And let me close some of this so you can see what's going on here. So we have this array of components that I put in here, and you could call this whatever you want, of course. Um, but I made an array here, and then I have a bunch of components. So I added a title. I said what component I want to grab. I passed fields if I needed to. So I didn't need any fields for the incrementer because it's a simple button. I didn't need any fields for the decrementer because it's a simple button. But for my grid, I want to add a couple of default fields here. And if I look back over on our site and look at this example, you can see that we're pulling in the incrementer, the decrementer, and then a basic grid here. And if we were actually to look over in our um, corresponding template, so this is in our blog template, 
you'll notice here that you know we didn't have to explicitly pull in all those different um, we did for a different example actually, but what we're doing here at the bottom is we're looping through those components and we're saying for each of those components, give me the title of the, the component and the fields out of that. Um, and then basically do a dynamic component and then get out of this all components object, get me um, that specific component there. And then we're using something that's basically uh, what we're calling a component signature. So every component has its own signature. And basically what this is, it's just the path that your component lives at converted into underscores. So if you were to look at here, um, we have our layout components decrementer.svelte. So that would become layout underscore components underscore uh, decrementer underscore svelte. And that way you can basically pull in any component without explicitly importing it and it'll get server side rendered and um, you'll be able to use it throughout your, your, your content that way. Um, and I think that's kind of cool for people who want to create like a standard API where they say, hey, we have these components available to us but we want to be able to set different order of those components based on our content source and people can kind of create those things on the fly. So that gives you the option to do something like that. Another thing you can do here uh, is if you want to do any um, custom things with your project, so we actually abstract as much as we can uh, from the, the user just so they're not overwhelmed by stuff that they're, they don't need to be concerned with. So let me... Uh, See if I can expand this a little bit so it's easier to see. Um, but there are certain things that we hide behind the scenes. So you, you'll notice that you didn't see a router, you didn't see an entry point, and you didn't see anything about the build process. So those things are not included out here in the open, but they are available to people who like to tinker. So you can do a plenty eject if you want to do something like that. And that gives you some options to actually pull in the main JS, um, which is setting up some of the hydration and the entry point. You can do your router, which is pulling a project called Navade, which is doing the client routing and it's doing the 404 handling and things like that. So if you ever want to eject any of these, um, and even for now, there's the build process. So we, we have a Go build process that's happening in V8, but we have an optional node-based one that mirrors basically what's happening there. So you could eject the build process and run it in Node if you wanted. Um, that may be deprecated at some point in one of the, the future releases. I think I'm moving more in the direction of there's some other projects that are doing node, node builds that are, are doing that great. So I think I might uh, move more in the direction of just supporting the Go stuff. So this may be deprecated, but for now you can eject your build process in, in Node and customize that if you wanted to. So if you were to do, say, say router, um, it gives you some information that says, hey, we can't guarantee if you do this, if it's going to continue working, if you, if you make updates to it, but I say yes. And then you can see here that I now have an ejected folder with my router information in there, and I can, I can make customizations to that if I wanted to. So that's something you can do there. Now, I I'm, know I'm, I'm kind of running along in time. I want to show uh, something else real quick if I can. Noah, please just interject if I'm, if I'm cutting into your time too much. Oh, time. no, no, no. Please keep going. I'm, I'm loving this. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I think something that might be cool to do is let's, let's actually stop our web server here and let's get out of this project and let's start a new project over here in our terminal. So I'm going to, I'm going to remove that folder. And uh, most people that want to start plenty projects are probably going to do something like this instead of, so this is the default starter that I just showed off and it's mostly for new people who are exploring the project, but most people that are going to create projects are probably going to pass this bear flag. And what that's going to do is it's going to do something similar to what we did before, but this time, it's basically going to create a scaffolding that has less information in it. So again, let me let's just open this in a Codium so we can see what's going on here. So it looks kind of similar. So we have assets, we have a favicon again, but our content is much simpler. We only have an index.json file. Our layouts doesn't have any of the scripts or the components. It basically has HTML wrapper, some metadata information to, to mount everything, and then it has the, the homepage served up there. Um, so there's not a ton going on. If I open this up and I do a plenty serve, and if I were to come back over here and let's just reload, uh, whoops, I don't want that. I want this. Okay, so basically it just shows a, a title on the page. So there's not a lot of information going on here. So this is a, a better way to start a, a basic project. So if you're starting from scratch, you, you'd probably want to start something like this. Now I want to show a cool new feature that we added to Plenty recently. So uh, Plenty has this concept of themes in it. So I started going through and I actually started creating the first theme for Plenty. If you were, were to go to our site, you'll notice that there's 
promise of a lot more themes coming. Um, but the, the first work has been done on this big spring, spring theme here. And I'm actually just porting this over from a Hugo theme that already existed. Um, but you can actually incorporate this into your own project. And if anyone's actually interested in like how this was made or how you would actually make a, a larger site in Plenty, I've started a YouTube series over here. So if you actually come to the homepage of the site and you say, see it in action, it opens up this playlist over here. And um, I gotta wait for YouTube to load, but. How hard was it converting over from the, the Hugo themes? I know the Hugo theme ecosystem is massive. Need a professional yeah, logo was, for your um, brand? I've used the new Wix so logo maker to create one for my startup. I'll show you how. My computer's just a little go to Wix slow logo right now, maker. so the video keeps starting and stopping. Start. Um, I'm gonna type it was, uh, it was really easy. Um, so, so basically that theme uses bootstrap and instead of, I actually continue to leverage bootstrap just to make things a little easier stylistically. Um, so it's pretty easy. I actually was able to copy over the markup for the most part. Um, and then I abstracted things into my own data source and I just did some of like the route overriding the plenty style instead of like the Hugo style. But, um, it's been a pretty seamless process. And if you want to see the whole process, it's pretty much filmed here. So it starts from like setting up your content structure, navigation, uh, content. I made everything a content driven component. So if you're confused by my example earlier, this will show you more about how to do that. You know, styles, um, all this stuff, it goes through here. And then there's a bunch more that I've already filmed that are going to be released over the next week or two. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you can really dive into any of those things there. Um, it'll show exactly how you could go through that process. And I, and I plan on making more themes and filming more of them. So uh, if you don't get everything you needed out of that, there'll, there'll be more to come in the future. But Basically here, so there's a whole theming structure in Plenty, which is kind of neat. And um, I tried to add, I just added this before, right before this meetup actually, but I had some instructions about how you can add this to an existing site, um, or if you want to make changes to this theme. Uh, basically every theme in Plenty is just a regular Plenty site. So there's no difference. You don't have to say like, oh, I'm making a theme or I'm making a site. You're just making the same thing. It doesn't matter. Um, and then you can infinitely nest themes within a site if you wanted. So I could make a theme that pulls from another base theme. So maybe there's a base theme that defines some kind of like um, layout structure, right? But it has no style. I could inherit from that and I could make my own specific styles, pull my own fonts and colors and whatever. And then someone could inherit from that and pull my base theme there. And it should work as an infinite nesting if they wanted to do that. Um, and then basically over here, if you want to pull in a theme, there's a command line utility for doing that. So let's see here, let me try to make some space. I can use plenty theme and I could add. And so I actually did this earlier. So you can see here, um, I'm doing plenty theme add. And then basically what you're doing is you're coming here to your code here and you're just copying like a basic Git like you would normally do. And you can just add that GitHub repository there. So you see that. And then what I'm doing here, this commit is optional. Now I'm just passing that commit flag. You don't have to do that. You could run this without that completely, but I'm passing that because I'm, I'm trying to show that you can actually get a specific um, place in history. So for instance, maybe you're using an old version of plenty and an older version of a theme worked with your site, but a newer version of the theme has been upgraded to work with a new version of plenty, but you want to use your old school stuff. You can go to a specific commit. So I think I went to like one of these older commits down here. I can't remember which one I grabbed here, B92. Um, so we grab this commit right here. And I'm saying, give me that theme at that specific place in history um, and download it there. So if I come here and I run that command, you'll see that it does a git download, but it's kind of interesting what's actually happening here. So I don't know if people are familiar with Hugo, but um, if you download a theme in Hugo, it has all the git information in it. And then you start dealing with things like sub modules. So if you were to git track your project in Hugo, oftentimes people are confused because they don't get their theme included in their project. And so when they try to deploy it or whatever, it's missing and it breaks their site. If you were to, you know, get track this project here, let's add everything. Whatever, let's take a look at the get status. You can see here, our theme has been added, right? So we added a themes folder, has all our theme information there and it adds it. So I can commit that now and just say add theme. And uh, it's, it's basically added all our theme information. And if we're looking here and we were to look at our themes folder that was just created, there's, there's, um, no dot git folder. So this is actually no longer a git project. It's just a regular project that's tracked throughout our, our, our plenty website. And you might think, well, how do I manage updates and things like that? That's kind of challenging now because it's no longer a git project. And that's kind of a cool thing that we've built in here. So if you were to go to your plenty.json file, 
And I'm just trying to make this so everyone can see what's going on here. Um, this theme config information was added by running that command. So it added some theme config information. It said, well, where's the URL that I'm getting this from? And it kept that information there. And where's my current status of, of, of where this commit is, right? So we're at this, this commit here. Um, now that it's tracking that information, I could do something like this. I could come to my site here and I could say plenty theme update and I could just target the big spring theme and I could update that and watch this hash here. It went and it got that newest version of that hash here. So if we were to do a get status, um, you can see there. So one of the new things is my theme. I, I added a readme and some other information there. So it downloaded the new information from the theme. It changed our plan out JSON to track the new, uh, the new commit hash there, but we can just add this to our project without worrying about sub modules or anything like that. So um, you could just say update our theme and that adds that information there. Um, another thing you could do here is, so themes inherit everything. So since every Plenty theme is just a Plenty site, you inherit the content, you inherit the assets, you inherit the templates. Now, some people might wanna do something like they just wanna reuse components or templates from a different theme, but they wanna use all their own content and they wanna use all their own images. So you could come here and you actually could do something like this. You can pass an exclude flag and you could say exclude and then you could just pass, say, I don't want any of the content and I don't want any of the assets, for instance. You could say, I don't want any of the layout. Maybe you just want the content. I don't know what you want. You might just want content. Maybe you just want images. I'm not sure. But you can exclude any of those aspects that you want and that should just work with your theme. And when you build, you won't inherit any of those. So you won't have any miscellaneous pages hanging out in the back and if you want something like that. Okay. I actually want that because I, in this case, I want to show my theme off exactly how it is. Um, so another thing I'm going to do here is let's just take a look at how themes work. So basically these themes have a bunch of, you know, content and uh, layouts and things like that in here. And um, anytime that we have content that matches, uh, you know, our, our base site here. So we have our base site, right? Our assets, content, layout, and then we have our themes, asset, content, layout. Anytime we have something that matches with our base site that matches our theme, it's going to be overridden. So our base site's gonna take precedence. So in this case, we have an index.json file. So this index.json file is gonna to continue to be read unless I delete it. So I'm going to delete that file. And then we have some layouts in our base um, folder, right? So we have our layout here. We have content, we have an index. I'm gonna get rid of that and delete that as well. And I'm even going to come up here and in our global, whoops, our global, I'm going to delete our head and, sorry, just come up here and delete our HTML as well. So what I've done here is I basically deleted all the default stuff that came with our base site. So we're gonna get everything just from the theme itself and not from our base site because we're not overriding anything, right? So let me just come back here and let me do something. So uh, the theme enabling and the theme downloading are completely um, separate from each other. So I could come in here and run plenty theme enable and I can enable big spring because big spring is the name of the folder of our theme, right? So that's how you, you figure out what you're naming. So enable big spring. And if you come up here, you'll notice that that added big spring to our theme key right here. So now we know what, what theme is enabled when we try to build our site. Um, and what's cool about this being separate is actually if you don't want to use Git to manage your theme, so for instance, maybe you downloaded your theme from Dropbox or Google Drive, or maybe you created it locally and it doesn't exist online at all, right? You're not going to have this, this information here. You're not going to have commits or a URL or anything like that. So you could actually completely remove this theme config information and you could just enable a theme that you put directly into your folder and you could have a theme exist that way. If this is just nice to have in case you want to get the upstream uh, updates in case someone's updating a theme. Um, so it allows you that option. Anyways, so I enable that theme there. And if I come here and I now uh, try to build my site, make sure I didn't make any errors here. So let me just serve that. Oh, it looks like I'm already running, oh, I'm already running my server over here. Um, okay, so let's come back over here to our main site and let's reload this. Okay, so now we're inheriting that theme exactly, right? So we're, we're pulling all that information from our theme and it has all the, that stuff that I created previously. Um, and if I, you know, you can go to the different pages, it has like a blog page, has these individual blog posts. So it's getting all the content and everything from that theme. Now, if we want to basically 
continue to pull upstream data from our theme, but we want to override it, we could do that simply. Let's come over here and let's, for instance, let's um, come to our, our uh, theme information. Let's go to our content, for instance, and let's grab the home page here. So I'm going to grab this. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to go up to our base information. And inside our content folder, I'm going to paste that file. So now we have index.json inside of our, um, our content root. And if I were to come over here and I were to change this, so um, we have a, a title here, right? So we have let us solve your critical uh, website development challenges. That's this right here. I could just come here and say, this is an override from my base site. And I could save that. And as long as that rebuilds, okay. And I come here and re reload this. So you can override your themes that way without actually changing anything in the theme itself. You can just override those templates. Um, another thing that you might have to worry about, um, and I'm, I'm going really long here, sorry Noah, um, this will be the last thing. Um, if you come in here, you'll notice that like pagination here is broken because you actually have to grab your routes from your, um, your theme. So we actually have, for instance, our, um, our, our theme has its own configuration file, so it has its own um, oops, plenty.json file. And so we have some routes in here and you notice that we have this paginated route. So this is another um, file name. So we actually can get uh, HTML fallbacks for each one of our paginated pages, which is really cool. Um, and the cool thing about this is you, it actually pulls information from your, uh, your Svelte templates. You can set up a pager in any manner you want. You don't, we don't force you to use any type of thing. And basically you just plug it into your backend here and it'll get how many pages, it'll figure all that out for you. Um, so I would love to, to go with this more, but I, I can't because I'm way over on time. So um, I would love to show pagination. I have a couple examples on our GitHub if you want to take a look at that at some point. But basically you could come in here and you could come into your, your main site, plenty.json again, and you could add these overrides. So um, if I were to come in here and paste the types and make sure I fix this and save that, as long as I didn't break how that looks, and I come over here, reload our blog. And now if I go to, okay, so now you can see it went to blog page two, we've seen different posts, blog page three, and these are all, um, they all have HTML fallback, so you can reload these um, and, and go back to those pages. You could share these links with people and they would still work. Um, pagination uh, is, is pretty cool. I'd love to show that off a little more at some point. So if anyone's interested in that, just reach out to me afterwards and, and we can talk about it. But I've taken up far too much time already, so um, yeah. I'll uh, hand it back over to Noah. No, that that was that was amazing. Uh, I am stupidly impressed. I, I cannot wait till the CMS comes out. This is like a trillion times better than WordPress <laughs> or Drupal. Oh, so, thank uh, you. Yeah. Bravo, like way to go. Thank you. I really is, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, that's that's really amazing. And it's got to be a ton of work, too. So uh, I, I just want to open it up to questions uh, before we uh, do the the five minute presentation. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I'm just super impressed. So yeah, anyone who has questions, feel free to chime in. Yeah. Congrats, man. That was super cool. Looks like things have really come a long way since Jamstack Denver. So congrats on all the work you put in. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I, think I know you're following all, all, I always see you following some of the stuff. So I always appreciate you, uh, tweeting at us and, and giving us feedback and things. So thanks so much. Yeah, for sure. And I especially enjoy the the examples you're building out because like with all these things, like building it is, is really just the first step now. And then like telling people about it is the second step and then actually explaining it to them is like the final step. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really curious, uh, just because this is something that I would actually be interested in kind of like contributing is what are some examples that you still want to build out? So yeah, like features that, that need to be added still kind of? Is that... Like things, so things that are already in the framework that you want to have examples to explain. Oh, that's a good point. Um, hmm. I think, well, I think the, the content driven stuff I think is really cool and I'd love to make that clear. I've, I've tried to add it in, but I, I think it's confusing how it is right now. So I'd like to make that a little more clear. Um, I would love to, to, to show some off some more pagination stuff at some point, just so people can see it. There are like repositories, but they're kind of hidden and they're not, they're not well explained. So I think like adding that information to the website to make it a little easier for folks would be nice. Um, and then I think the theming, 
like incorporating that into the website so it's easier for people to get started and take a look at themes, I think would be another big step. Um, I don't know if there's any like more features really hidden behind the scenes um, than that at this point, but um, th there's probably, I mean, around routing and replacement patterns and all that stuff, there's always like hidden things that I even forget about sometimes. Um, there's a lot of like little uh, CLI flags, like you can change ports so you can run a bunch of different local web servers. You can run as many as you want. Um, you can like change the build directory. Like, so for instance, if you're building to GitHub pages, you might have to make the build directory a certain name. So you can change that name if you want. There's a lot of like little flags and things that you can do. Yeah, that was the other question I had actually was, um, was deployment and like, is there, is it optimized for specific like Netlify versus for cell or is it basically anything that's going to host static files will be pretty much good to go? You should be able to host it anywhere where you want static files. Um, I, I made some examples like on the website about uh, deploying to GitHub pages and GitLab pages just because I figured that might be the, you know, for, for people tinkering with it, they just want like a free and easy way to, to get something up. So I wanted to show how to do those, but you should be able to deploy it to, to other systems like Netlify or, or whatever. Um, and it should work, but I haven't done a ton of testing around that. And honestly, like it's not super optimized. I think it's pretty fast and things work pretty well, but there's like tons of things that could be optimized if you really, you know, if you, if you want to make it um, better. So I, I think for now, I'm just trying to get things working and get some features built in, but uh, that'll be something I'm going to do down the road. Cool, man. I, I, awesome. I know this might be a tough question, but wh when do you think the CMS is coming out for this? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, and that's something that I've, I've done a terrible job communicating because I, I had it up on the website for a while, like it was already, it already existed. And I think that uh, confused people and rubbed people the wrong way because it was false advertising a little bit. It was not my intention. I actually just get really excited about these things and uh, I, I, I sometimes get ahead of myself. But the CMS is probably um, a little ways out because I haven't done a lot of work on it, to be honest. Um, so, so I changed that to coming soon. Who, who knows what soon is? But it's something, it's like a core principle of what I wanted to do with this project. So it's not like something that's going to be pushed off indefinitely. I wanted to, to, to fix some of like the engine stuff and, and add some of these like must have features. Like it's hard to, to build any real site without some pagination and some other things. So I want to make sure those things were in there and make it kind of work as a static site generator. And now I'm like really getting to the point where I'm pretty close to focusing on the CMS full time. So I'm hoping, um, it won't be you know pushed out forever but it'll probably be at least months out i don't think it's going to happen it's not going to be like next month or something like that so it'll probably be a couple months down the road um, but it's, it's definitely something that is like a top priority and it, it's like one of the the foundation principle principles of why i created the project in the first place so um, stay tuned for it but unfortunately it's probably not going to happen like tomorrow are, are you once once the cms comes out are you planning on like going after um like WordPress and Drupal and like uh, creating like migration guides and like trying to push people in that direction? That's a, well, yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of sites that are on WordPress and Drupal shouldn't be on WordPress and Drupal. Um, I, I think there are going to be plenty of things that WordPress and Drupal do that plenty will never do um, just because, it, you know, static sites, they're great, but they, you know, like if you have like really robust permissions and workflows and things like that, like you could fake it with something like Plenty or even any other static site generator, but it's never going to be great at that. So I don't plan to ever do everything WordPress and Drupal are doing. I just think that very simple low-end sites that need fast hosting that are extremely cheap and not vulnerable to security updates every week that you have to stay on top of. For people who want that kind of experience, I do think that maybe it could to, could take some of those sites. But I, I don't know, I look at those projects more like allies than enemies because I think there's lots of like big proprietary things that I could take market share from as well. So I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't have any plans to like eat anybody's specific market share, but I think there's a lot of projects that maybe something like this could be better suited for. So I'm hoping that, yeah, some of those smaller sites might migrate to something like this. In terms of migration path, I actually would love to, build in like um, kind of content mesh type features like, you know, like Gatsby's really great. They have tons of plugins to integrate with Salesforce or Drupal or WordPress and pull in information on build time and build out content sources. I've looked into to, um, some Go frameworks that actually could pull from JSON APIs. And since our content source is already set up to feed into our, our templates, I think we could do a cool system of like building either from like a Drupal content source or some other system. Um, but again, I think that's going to be 
a phase after the CMS. So I think CMS first, then that. So that's probably a ways down the road, although I'd love to see it at some point. Does that answer that question? No, definitely. That's, um, that, that's, that, that makes a lot of sense. Cause yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking, I got to thinking about uh, Drupal's uh, permission system. That'd be hard to, hard to, <laughs> hard to do. But. Yeah. Um, but no, I think, I think that's awesome. Um, so somebody did comment about uh, GraphQL. Uh, any, any comments on that? Yeah. I, th so I think um, GraphQL is, is awesome. I think, like one of the main advantages of Gatsby. So Gatsby's really cool because it does like, you know, the, the whole reactive front end and that's awesome. But like it's really big advantage, I think, is the fact that it's a content mesh, right? It has a huge plugin ecosystem and then it converts everything into a standardized thing that you can interact with in your templates, right? So it makes everything GraphQL. So you start interacting with things in a consistent manner. Um, I think that's really cool. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't know if that'll be built into plenty. Maybe depends on how difficult and how feasible and you know the time the time horizon. But um, if someone were to help me with it and and has some knowledge in that space, I would definitely be. Um, yeah. Okay. Just joking. Uh, thinking about. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Like I don't know if I would. It it's probably wouldn't be in the near term. I, I think um, for for the near term, it might just be like pulling from REST endpoints and, and, and copying some JSON down. But who knows where it goes in the future. Yeah, I would love to be. I would love to have some of the functionality of Gatsby, but I just feel like that's a much bigger project, and I, I don't know if we'll get there in the near term. That makes sense. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, feel free to jump in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. GraphQL is not a weekend project. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Great. Well, no, thanks so much for let me. And I'm sorry I took up so much time. I, I feel like I ate into your. No, no, no. My, 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 mine's only going to be like five minutes. Um, okay. It's going to be a quick, quick demo. So this was perfect. Okay. And uh, yeah, no. And please, uh, please come back. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'd be happy to. Yeah. So we'd love, yeah, we'd love to have you back. And um, just a quick pitch anyone who wants to give a talk or a demo, um, Obviously, you can build a great project like Plenty, but you can also just have a, uh, a quick demo that you're working